This edition of I Italy New York is brought to you by L'energia non si ferma mai L'energia crea si trasforma diventa un'idea per generare nuova energia Diamo all'energia un'energia nuova and Cirio chopped tomatoes. Coming up on I Italy, Americans in love with Italy. Francine Sagan interviews Richard Pena, Dolce Vita, tailored cuisine with Rosanna and Daryl, Papardelle al Ragù. People, 25 years of Bordighera Press. Events, the adventures of Dylan Dog at NYU. And now let's start with Richard Pena. Richard Pena was director of the New York Film Festival for Lincoln Center from 1988 through 2012. Richard organized major film series devoted to international cinema. He organized retrospectives of numerous directors, including Italy's Michelangelo Antonioni. He is a professor of film studies at Columbia University, where he specializes in film theory and international cinema. And this year, he's a visiting professor in Latin American studies at Princeton University. He is the co-host of Channel 13's popular weekly movie program, Real 13. I'm looking forward to chatting with Richard about his love of Italy and Italian cinema. I'm so excited to chat with you, Richard, about so many things, uh, Italian film. Good to be here. So you traveled through Italy for studying film? Well, when I was working for the New York Film Festival, uh, I would go to Italy every year to see the new crop of Italian films for the various programs that we were doing. And then in the year 2000, we began a series at Lincoln Center called Open Roads, New Italian Cinema, which I'm happy to say has become really the leading U.S. showcase for new Italian films. So I had very, very close relations with people at Cinecittà and the various government agencies because we did so much Italian film at Lincoln Center. Where are some centers in Italy where you visited? Well, I think if you really want to kind of do almost anything in film, you have to go to Rome because that's where most of the producers and whatever are. But Bologna, for example, has the best film archive in Italy. They do wonderful restorations, especially very early Italian silent films. And we once did a big program with them on that and continue to have worked with them over the years. But actually, one of the things in recent Italian films is it's become quite regional. You now have filmmakers who live and work in, uh, well, in Milan, in Sicily, but in Puglia, in Bari, in places where you never really thought of as filmmaking centers or areas. But now, of course, with the new equipment, people can make films anywhere. True. At Lincoln Center, what were some of the successful film series, the Italian favorites? Well, I guess of all the Italian shows that I did, the one that I was most proud of was a very big show that we did on neorealism. Because, you know, neorealism, Italian neorealism is really, for me, one of the watershed moments in film history. It's really a kind of a, a game changer, not only for Italy, but for all of world cinema. But unfortunately, as happens over time, when people say in the U.S. would talk about it, they were only talking about three or four films, uh, five at most. Films that were for always the ones that were shown. Who- for those of us who don't know, okay. give us a little 101 of what okay. time period. What, we're, what we're talking right after the war when Italian film studios were, were largely destroyed or very seriously damaged during the war. So Italian filmmakers began taking their cameras out into the streets, shooting you know, with natural light on real locations, very often stories about common people, in a way really kind of offering a very different kind of cinema that 
anyone had been used to it. It had a huge effect all over the world, really, of a different way that you could make films. What would be a few films that we might well, know? Well, probably Rome, Open City, The Bicycle Thief, Paisa, oh. uh, La Terra Trema. These are kind of the classics that one thinks of when you think of Italian neorealism. You know, as I said, the four or five that get shown repeatedly, and they should. They're great films, you know, so you should show them again. But it always sort of bothered me a bit that uh, the movement was actually much broader and I think even more interesting than people knew about. So I decided I wanted to do a very large series on neorealism. So after a few years, uh, I was able to put together about 40 films from the period 1945 to 1954 with the help, of course, of friends in Italy. And we did a major retrospective on that theme at Lincoln Center in 2009. And I was very, very proud of that series because it really, I think, helped shift the discussion and open people up to a whole other group of other directors such as La Tuada and DeSantis and Jeremy and people who were really quite great but you know in a certain way had been forgotten uh, a bit in this country. What would be a few films that are lesser known but still worthy? Oh gosh there are so many. Well I mean if you think of just something like uh, The Railroad Man by uh, Pietro Germi or La Tuada's film um, uh, you know, The Thief or uh, Senza Pietà. I mean, these are really films that all came out at that time, which give us different shapes and flavors of neorealism, that it wasn't just one thing and, and whatever. So in a way, I wanted to round out that picture as much as I possibly could. And uh, again, I think it had a nice impact. Uh, the series was extremely popular, but I think more shifted the discussion a little bit. And I'm glad that even I find in academia, people now have a somewhat broader notion notion of what neorealism was about. Well, thank you. I'll look that up too. <laughs> Tell me some other categories of Italian film that you think would be worthy for our audience to, to look up and to see. Well, there's, you know, again, so much. Italian cinema is just one of the richest of all national cinemas. Um, certainly the period in the 50s and early 60s was a moment when Italian cinema almost seemed to be able to do no wrong because on the one hand they had great, what you might think of as very serious artistic masterpieces by people like Fellini and Antonioni, a little bit later Bertolucci or Bellocchio, uh, but at the same time they had a fantastically successful popular cinema, the wonderful Italian comedies from that era, you know, people like Monicelli or Dino Risi. And that was, I think, always the strength of Italian cinema, is that you had both of these segments coexisting. Such a rich film history. What about contemporary? Italian movies. Well, I was really happy that last year the Oscar went to La Grande Bellezza, which I think is a terrific film by Paolo Sorrentino. But, you know, there's really a lot of good Italian filmmaking going on. It's really, I think, not so much the fault of the Italians as it is of our own very limited film culture here in the United States. Uh, we have very few cinemas that show foreign language subtitled films, and unfortunately, the audience for that kind of cinema has dwindled over the years. But you know, each year, I think Italy creates quite a few interesting films. Uh, unfortunately, they're not that well known to the American public. Is there some hallmark of an Italian film that differentiates it from a Spanish or American film? I don't really think so. I mean, I think it gets very difficult to make those distinctions because even in Italian cinema, I mean, how do you describe one cinema that contains both Antonioni and Totò? I mean, you know, it's an enormous range of sensibilities that are sort of being, you know, uh, presented there. So I, I think it's hard to really say there's one essence of something that is Italian. You know, I would say that, and again, one of the hallmarks for me of Italy has been, over the years, generally the ability to keep both a, a kind of popular cinema and a kind of more ambitious artistic cinema sort of in balance. And often with films produced by the same company, you know, which is, I think, very interesting as well. So that was, I think, during the great years of Italian cinema in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, something that really did distinguish it. Thank you so much, Richard. My it was pleasure. Such a delight to okay. We've got to go see a movie. You should. <laughs> Let's live the Dolce Vita.
I'm making meatballs. This. Yes, look at that. It's no. beautiful. Metti poi la americana? Uh, what's the difference? No, Italian this. What do you no, mean? No, 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 no. Italian meatballs with egg noodles, but how do you say that? No Italian? noodles. No, 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 no. Pappardelle. Pappardelle. Perfect. Oh, okay. I did Perfect. good. And the meatballs we made are not what you would expect if you're American, because instead of the size of a tennis ball or even a golf ball, these are only the size of an olive. Very, very small. Very small. We made our meatballs by taking the raw meat, we added salt, fresh Parmesan, not from a shaker. That's it. That's it. Extra virgin olive oil. Then we uh, warmed up the virgin oil, extra virgin oil, in the pan. We let that get really hot. Yes. And then we put the meat into the, uh, the pot. Let them brown, yes. right? Yes, for five then, minutes, five, six minutes. Five, yes. six minutes, they're very small. And then we added our tomato sauce. Tomato sauce of Italian. Tomato Italian sauce. tomato sauce. I learned that you should at least make your sauce very slow cook, maybe two hours before or even the day before. Only in the morning, eat it. Yes, it actually makes the house smell really good too. Typical pasta. Right. This is a pappardelle with egg. Egg pasta. Egg pasta, yes. What if you don't mix? It just makes a hard big ball. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. And that only takes a few minutes. Yes. And then we take the uh, finished sauce with the meatballs, mix it up, and we add some fresh Parmesan and some fresh basil, basil and it's perfect. meet some wonderful Italian people in New York. This evening we're celebrating 25 years of Vordiera Press, 1989 to 2014. Vordiera Press came out of the need to gain control of the means of production, for especially for Italian-Americans. It really goes way back. With the $7,000 grant from the Agnelli Foundation, when they were still in the United States and working, we put together Voices in Italian-Americana. It started with the anthology from the margin. And we had, we didn't think we were gonna have enough material for an anthology. We ended up having a lot more material, so we said, let's start a journal and when we went to the um, lawyer's office, we needed to have a name for the corporation. We thought we would just name it Via Corporations. At that time, I really didn't think that we would have other products. We would just do this journal, Voices in Italian Americana. And so we were sitting around, what are we going to name this thing? And, you know, I was born in Melrose Park. Anthony was born in Stanford, Connecticut. They didn't sound like good names. And possible, you know, I'm born in Bordighera. It's a little town on the Italian Riviera. Just to give you a perspective, you look out from the Lungomare Argentina, and you see Monte Carlo. It's about a 45 minute drive away. It's a very pretty place. No American could spell it, no American could pronounce it. Uh, but we have gotten people to spell it correctly and pronounce it correctly over the last 25 years. It was not well accepted by some people. They thought it was too frivolous. We thought it was irreverent, and we thought it was respectfully irreverent. We felt that there should be a name that would stick out, and there is, so we thought Bordighera would be good.
So it was really sort of um, nicely uh, uncanny how at the very beginning of our book publishing, we went from Italian American poetry to Italian literature, criticism on Italian literature, to a first extensive review in English of Joseph Tuziani's work. The goal was to create a place where the best Italian American writing that wasn't being accepted elsewhere would could appear. Uh, I, I always call it the safety net. Then as we began to publish one after another after another and reprinting books like uh, the translations of Gramsci's Southern Question, things we would use in the classroom, uh, we began to see that there is a need for a press that is identified as being Italian-American. Today we sit here and we have, uh, depending on how we count, anywhere from 160 to 180 volumes that we've done over the last 25 years. It's done quite well, way beyond our expectations, way, way beyond our expectations. The books that we are publishing today are really first class. Some of our books have been accepted by mainstream, um, if anything, in the sense that they have been uh, reviewed by various uh, national magazines, uh, including Publishers Weekly. It, it's amazing that these 25 years have flown by so quickly uh, but the need today is even greater than the need was at the beginning. I mean, we needed to have some place to start, but now a lot of writers are finding their home. A lot of writers are preferring to publish with Bordighera Press because it has created this wonderful identity. We've published authors that range from the unknown to um, Joseph Tuziani uh, to Felix Definile to um, someone that, if you're in theater, you know who he is, Marco Martinelli, to Dacia Maraini, and to Franca Rame. And so our list really is wide. We've given, I think, some life to, Itali some, some, uh, some life to Italian American poets, Italian American uh, novelists, and so it's, it's, been a, it's been an interesting 25 years, it's been a very good 25 years. The goal, I think, for the next 25 years is to incorporate more Italian and more mainstream vehicles, uh, whether it's a press, whether it's a museum, whether it's a, a, uh, any other kind of uh, cultural institution, to institutionalize Italian-American culture so people don't have these misperceptions. In, in, in years past, when you brought your postcard or envelope, when you brought your postcard, not so much your regular envelope, to the post office in Bordighera, they would cancel out the stamp and they would have a little saying. Per vivere in eterna primavera non c'è posto al mondo che bordighera. And I'll leave that for our Italian, non-Italian speakers to learn Italian to figure out what that means. Coming up next, our exclusive event. Claudio Di Biagio, 26 anni, aspirante o potenziale regista italiano e autodidatta. E questa cosa purtroppo in Italia non è vista bene. E niente, vengo dal web, fondamentalmente la, 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 la mia nascita creativa è sul web dove ancora c'è un po' di libertà appunto nel mio paese. Diciamo che mh, negli ultimi 4-5 anni sto tentando insieme a tanti altri e insieme a Luca Vecchi che è il mio collega in questo progetto, vittima degli eventi, di apportare una piccola rivoluzione in Italia nell'audiovisivo e nella comunicazione audiovisiva. Io sono Valerio Di Benedetto, ho 29 anni e sono un attore di Roma. La mia formazione nasce dal teatro, in questo percorso formativo ho diciamo, associato spettacoli teatrali a web series, a magari progetti più o meno indipendenti, che mi hanno portato poi ad avere un'esperienza tale e a conoscere delle persone per arrivare poi a fare questo progetto. Ogni individuo è vittima della propria maledizione. Qual è la sua, signor Dog?
decidiamo di fare vittima degli eventi, quindi questo fan movie, un vero e proprio film ispirato a Dylan Dog, perché in 30 anni non ha mai ricevuto, secondo noi, diciamo, la giustizia che, che, che appartiene al fumetto in audiovisivo. Ci hanno provato gli americani, eh, avendo i diritti audiovisivi del personaggio, non ci sono riusciti e quindi noi abbiamo chiesto agli utenti e soprattutto ai lettori di, di Dylan Dog, italiani e non, di supportarci. I was fascinated by the fact that it's one of the first uh, Italian film produced with crowdfunding. And I believe there is a lot to explore there. You don't need to find a rich producer to make a good film with professional actors and with a professional crew. The people who believed in the project paid for it and are enjoying it. And I think already that's a great idea. Io e Francesca Bianchi, la mia co-founder di The Creative Shake, abbiamo conosciuto Claudio circa due anni fa qua a New York. Quando mi ha parlato di questo progetto, diciamo, di crowdfunding, abbiamo subito pensato che fosse anche un'opportunità per noi, per far conoscere, diciamo, un prodotto, se così vogliamo chiamarlo, italiano, negli Stati Uniti. Grazie anche a Sara Massarotto, eh, che ha una forte esperienza nelle PR, siamo riusciti appunto ad attirare l'attenzione dei media americani ed italiani negli Stati Uniti. Quando ragioniamo su Dylan Dog, ragioniamo quindi su un fumetto che nasce 30 anni fa in Italia, da disegnatori e sceneggiatori italiani, Tiziano Sclavi non aveva nemmeno mai viaggiato eh, più fuori di Parigi, quindi non era mai nemmeno arrivato a Londra, non c'è mai stato. Quindi si sta parlando di persone che immaginano un, un mood che lo completano in una sorta di cartolina con quello che vivono loro e quindi con l'Italia. Roma diventa un personaggio, Roma diventa un personaggio importante nella storia perché eh, cattura esattamente il mood che il fumetto ha. È eh, una rivisitazione, un reboot, è moderno ed è soprattutto contestualizzato. In Italia abbiamo un sacco di problemi, il Dylan Dog ha i problemi che ha l'Italia, quindi eh, questo è molto importante. Di tutti gli incubi in cui potessi capitare, questo è quello più spaventoso. Sette mesi. Sette mesi senza l'ombra di un caso. È davvero tutto finito? Davvero si è trattato soltanto di un sogno, Dylan? Vittima degli eventi non è il film definitivo su, su Dylan Dog, è una nostra rivisitazione, io e Luca eh, abbiamo pensato fin dall'inizio a come portare, a come creare una, una rotondità vera e propria attorno al personaggio, una plausibilità. Quindi la prima cosa che tu devi fare, specialmente quando vai ad, ad affrontare un libro, un comic book, insomma qualsiasi cosa non sia nativo cinematografico, è ragionare sulla, sul tra, trasform, sulla trasformazione di questa, di questa, su, su un altro media. Il fumetto. E molte inquadrature, molte eh, atmosfere, molti colori sono prettamente presi da, dal fumetto, ricordano fedelmente. No, perché è un incubo che si rispetti, non c'è mai fine. Siamo stati molto tranquilli in fase di preparazione, abbiamo preparato il personaggio prima, mesi prima e quindi in realtà approcciando in questo modo quando siamo andati poi sul set avevamo ben chiaro ogni tipo di eh, direzione che dovevamo prendere e una volta portato a termine il lavoro io sono stato molto soddisfatto cioè rifare tutto da capo come abbiamo fatto. That um, Dylan Dog is definitely one of the most beloved characters in Italian comics. But right here we are in Martin Mister's land. Uh, Martin Mister, who is another character created for the same publisher of, of Dylan Dog, is a professor at New York University and he has his little apartment exactly three blocks from Casa Italiana. And since Martin Mister and Dylan Dog also got together in a couple of adventures, I think it's a great way to bring them back together in this occasion. Lo portiamo qua in America grazie innanzitutto a, a una connessione con The, The Creative Shake, che è un'agenzia che ci ha supportato e grazie alla casa italiana della New York University. E lo portiamo qua quasi con un sorriso in bocca e la, la curiosità, perché comunque è qui che Dylan Dog è stato trattato male. Quindi è una cosa abbastanza per noi importante ed è molto molto emozionante. Fisicamente la prima volta che vengo a New York sono rimasto completamente rapito, poi non so perché mi sento a casa.
This edition of iItaly TV was brought to you by Colavita Extra Virgin Olive Oil and Baci Perugina Chocolate. Say I love you in the Italian way. Coming up on I Italy. Americans in love with Italy. Francine Sagan meets Jeffrey Horowitz, the artistic director of Theater for a New Audience. Dolce Vita, eat it, love it, crave it. A contemporary Italian bakery on West 14th Street. Events, the orchestra of the Teatro Reggio at Italy, New York. <laughs> 